Now, deep in the British jungle. Jesse Watson. Hello there. I'm at a uh, Pentra E fan in Pembrokeshire. It's just, uh, the sun has just risen. It's about dawn. I've been staying here for a, for, since yesterday. Um, as I've mentioned to people uh, subscribed to my channel, I've been making a film over the last few months, which is still in the pipeline. Um, but I just had a thought. Well, a, a, by the way, apologies if there is wind on the mic. Um, I don't have a wind baffle for my mic. But uh, this just a little video on, the, on something to do with the construction of dolmens. And, uh, well... Regarding Pentra Ifan here, but uh, others as well, it's a thought I've been wondering about for a for a while, and that is how they got the capstone. Oh, it's backwards. It's really hard. <laughs> how they got the capstone onto the dolmen. Um. Can I show you the scale of that, by the way? Can I stick my tripod in the ground there, perhaps? Well, should I be stick? Yes, I can. I'll just run over there to show you the scale. Secret powers were revealed to me the day I held aloft my magic sword and said, By the power of Grayskull! <laughs> So, it's convenient, that works. Um, <clears throat> yeah, how did they get the capstone on to the dolmens? Now, there is a common um, consensus, which personally I disagree with, having, uh, after having visited quite a few of these dolmens. The consensus is that originally they had mounds over them. Um, that they were contained within a mound and that that mound has disappeared over the years. Personally, I, yeah, I don't subscribe to that idea. <gasps> Because they're such sculptural forms, so clearly such sculptural forms. And now I may be wrong here, but to my eye, uh, these kind of dolmens like this one, King Arthur's dolmen in, uh, sorry, Trevethy Coit in Cornwall, also uh, like Kilclooney Dolmen over in Ireland and um, Kilmoge Dolmen. The, well, for me, they're such impressive uh, sculptural forms that, to my eye, to cover them up would be, uh, firstly, to cover them up doesn't make much sense. Uh, they'd lose much of their uh, majesty in being covered up. Also, I find it, well, the discussion of uh, earth mounds being covered in, being covered over them. Something like Kilclooney Dolmen, I'll put a picture on to this video. Something like Kilclooney Dolmen in Ireland. Um, were you to cover it with earth, the earth would simply, the, the chamber under the capstone isn't isn't enclosed properly, so the earth would just pour inside it. Um, so yeah, I think th there were clearly uh, tombs or chambered. There weren't actually any. There haven't actually been any bodies found in this. I don't know if that's because of the acid soils or not. But um, whether they were primarily tombs is a, is another question. Um, there's so little known about these things. Again, personally, I find it kind of irritating when you look on so many sites that these these kind of statements get made about them. With and a lot of the time, you just it's, well, where's the 
where's the real proof of this? It's just somebody's interpretation. And, and yet, yeah, that majority consensus thing ends up being stated like it's a fact when actually the majority of the time it's just one, it's just somebody's idea about it. So I don't feel any uh, worries. I don't think there's any worries about challenging that idea. And this mound thing is one of those ideas that just, when we find so many of these dolmens and there's no trace of a mound around it, what is that? Because we find burial mounds going right back and the mound remains in situ. A mound, once it's got turf over it, it remains and, and if anything, as the biomatter builds up, the mound gets, can get bigger. Um, so why do we have these burial mounds that remain intact, or these mounds of stone, whatever, that remain intact through, throughout time, thousands of years, and then suddenly the mounds that are around dolmens disappear? Where's the, well, where's the logic there? I don't see any logic to that. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Somebody would have to physically remove it, which is I'm going to get to in a second. Um, also, it's a, a common kind of go-to explanation there is that um, it was grave robbers or whatever, um, treasure hunters, and they've broken into the tomb. But again, they don't. I've seen actual burial chambers on uh, Bodmin Moor where that's happened, and obviously they just break into one side of the mound um, and do as little removal of material as they can get away with to access the where the um, where the burial where the burial goods are found. So the idea that they'd remove the entire mound is just silly, and again, the mound will stay there once they've gone to what remains of it. Um, again, like, yeah, I, so yeah, anyway, I found the idea of these mounds just simply, strangely kind of evaporating nonsensical. However, and on top of that, um, one of the sort of things of these uh, capstones of how they got the capstone onto the dolmen is an earth mound. Now, again, I'm going to give an alternative, and actually there is an alternative out there that's already been, makes much more sense, but it had, the pieces haven't quite been put together. I'm going to put them together for you because I just happened upon something today which was exactly what I was thinking, how they actually got these capstones on. And... Uh, Lo and behold, some of the BBC has actually made a CGI reconstruction of it, but they've not, to my eye, they haven't understood what they're actually looking at. So, um, to my eye, I might be wrong, of course, just put in this book as an idea. So, um, the idea of an earth mound, of dragging, like I think as, oh, another again, a little bit of video, Sumber Island, the people over in Sumber, they're still building megalithic, uh, monuments and they pull them with actually uh, organically made organic uh, ropes and um, yeah they do it they pull stones weighing 40 tons 50 tons huge stones they pull them in teams um, so that's not beyond the wit of man to my um, knowledge in with that in the Great Britain it's rather different like in Egypt you've got um, in Egypt, you've, uh, it's a very dry, obviously, well, actually, where, was it so dry when the pyramids were being built is another question. But you've got a very dry climate um, to uh, build your, to, to pull your boulders on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, in the Britain, you've, you've got some very different, you've got some serious is issues with wet ground and uh, water. 
haven't you? Um, being I'm from farming stock myself, and I, I know very well that, um, yeah, the Britain, it's, there's only a couple of months, July, August, it's parts of September, um, where the ground's dry enough to withstand any serious um, vehicles or just people walking on it without turning into a muddy path. Um, just the footfall very quickly uh, damages the turf and you end up with a muddy path. So for me, um, so yeah, if, you, if you've got a 10, 15 ton, whatever, capstone that you're dragging along, if you get a load of earth in Britain and pile it up and then try and drag a 10 or 15 ton stone onto that mound, I'm yeah, 99.9% sure that unless you make huge A-frames, but even then, that pile of earth isn't going to withstand the weight. It's just going to start collapsing and sinking in, particularly if you've just made it. Now, again, if you're talking in the Neolithic, they didn't have heavy um, earth-moving equipment. So... Yeah, they didn't have huge uh, diggers and things to compact the earth and make it very uh, solid once they built the mound. At best, they could have gone around with stakes or whatever, driving them, um, tamping the ground. But again, it's not going to make it hard enough, in my mind, to take the strain of pulling a 10, 15 ton huge boulder up, up it, up a gradient. That boulder's just going to want to dig in and plough through the side of the mound and, um, yeah, displace it. So, I think that actually it's far, far more sensible and more likely in Britain uh, anyway um, in when you've got a wetter climate. The use of earth in that way doesn't make, doesn't make much sense. It doesn't bear the load. What will bear the load is stone, small pieces of stone. The other problem you have when you're pulling a capstone up onto the top, is to add on to this, the other problem you have is that um, as you pull up, as you pull this capstone onto the top of these, um, of these legs, if, the, if you've just got an earth mound around that, presumably on, on the inside as well. Earth, again, it doesn't pack things very solidly unless it's incredibly tightly packed again. So a two meter high pile of earth around this, or two and a half meter high around this dolmen when you're dragging that capstone up, um, there's nothing really presuming that they that they build these legs and they put those upright first. That's my first initial, um, it's the fairly obvious construction sort of order, that you, you put these, uh, you make these upright, perhaps around them to some extent. You get these legs upright and then you encase the whole thing in your mouth in order that when you drag the capstone up and onto the top, you don't push these legs over. So you encase those. Right? Um, and that way, if they're getting pushed hard as you're pulling this capstone on, they don't uh, end up tilting over and uh, losing, so that when you, yeah, so they uh, don't take the weight. So for me, we often find a court of small pieces of stone around these dolmens. It's, it's, um, or, or there's part of it remaining. It's called a court commonly. So it's smaller pieces of stone around the ground, just making a sort of pavement around it. That's obviously the first thing to disappear. Now, my thought is that that court, that small court, the court of small pieces of stone, what it actually is, is the remains of a mound of small pieces of stone that they used um, to encase these legs 
and build, uh, th they built a mound of stone around this dolmen, around these legs, and then dragged this capstone up that mound of stone. Now here is the video, which I just stumbled across about Pencherifen and a reconstruction of it. I can actually see where that, where that uh, lays here. Here's that video. Now, looking at this video, this is exactly what I was thinking would be the perfect way to get this capstone on. Now here, they're using this reconstruction. It's obviously, this, they're, um, I haven't researched a great deal actually what's behind this, but it's, uh, from a little bit I've read about it, this reconstruction is what they thought the dolmen originally looked like. I don't think it is. I think what they're actually looking at here and what they've, what the remains of this mound here, what it actually is, is the remains of their, of the construction which they built in order to raise this capstone. And then they took away the whole thing to leave it. That's the magic trick. They build this mound of stone, take it away, and you leave this stone floating in midair to all those people who come and look at it. They take away the mound entirely. That's why we don't find any trace of the mound. It's not because it's somehow strangely just disintegrated and disappeared over the years. It's because they built it and then took it away the moment that when they'd got the capstone on, when they'd finished, to leave this astonishing sculptural form in place that, le that leaves you thinking, well, how the hell did they get the capstone up there? That's incredible. These guys must be giants. Are they wizards? What are they? That's the power of these structures. To, uh, to my eye. Now, of course, I don't go wrong, but Kilcluny Dolmen in Ireland, for example. Um, if you look at Kilcluny Dolmen, on the back of it, you see this on various dolmens. On the back post, on this, the this dolmen here that we're looking at here, sorry, is unusual in that the capstone is almost flat. Normally, they're running at a um, at an angle like like this on top. That's one of those sort of signature features of, of dolmens um, normally. But this one is unusually almost horizontal. It's not quite, but almost. But um, where was I? Yeah, if you look at Kilcluny Dolmen here, where this capstone um, sits on this back leg, there is actually a little stone wedged in there about um, six inches deep or something, not even that, four inches. And what that stone does is it just makes the bottom, the capstone on Kilcluny Dolmen is a particularly sort of interesting shape. It's got a flat on, on, on one edge of it and then an angle going up the back and then a uh, sort of peak on the top and a curve along the back. It's a particularly sort of sculptural form. So there's actually a flat on the underneath of it. On, on the end where it sits above this, on this back leg. And you can see that they've put in this wedge in order to set, in order that that capstone rests at, the, at a really nice angle to bring out the lines of it. I found that particularly interesting because it means that they didn't, um, to me, it shows that they were particularly interested in, interested in, the, in the sculptural form of what the dolmen looked like when you stood back. If the entire thing is firstly, if the entire thing is buried in a mound, you're not even going to be able to see that. You're just creating a ceiling and some walls. So it doesn't, you're not really going to take in what angle that ceiling is specifically. And a little block in the, in the back wedging it up a bit spoils it if it's that kind of construction. That block on the, above the back leg here, to me, shows that they wanted to get a nice angle for the top stone so that when you stood back and, and, and looked at the dolmen, it had the, the nice lines to it. I found that particularly, it was a particularly it evidenced the way that they were looking at these things, that it was actually the sculptural, the lines of it were important to them. They weren't simply following a set kind of, uh, a very old set sort of tradition of, okay, we place three stones and then we put a capstone on and that's the thing. It's all in the ritual of sort of the build. It showed that they were actually really concerned about the aesthetics of it to me. Um, 
which I kind of guessed, but that just that little wedge stone, you might say I'm reading a lot into it, but it, it shows, to me, it proves that. That could, because it's spoiled in a way, if it was just a pure construction, it, it, it almost spoilt the construction in it being there. It kind of spoilt the simplicity of those stones. And it showed that actually their priority was more that it had nice lines, as the aesthetic appearance of it was more important than the purity of it being made from six boulders and no small stones. They sort of broke that, um, they sort of broke that, that ethic or what they, they defied what we might think of as that ethic of they just use these big boulders. No, they put in a little wedge because they wanted the angles to be right. So yeah, I think this uh, video that I've just stumbled across shows the construction of the capstone. It shows that they've built this mound of small stone, which if you've got, if you've got say 100, 200 people pulling on uh, these ropes in order to pull this capstone onto the top. Building a large mound of small stone, considering we're not in the middle, then they wouldn't have been in the middle of uh, nicely tilled, cleared land. They would have been standing on a rough place with stone all over the top of the soil. Um, so if they've got 100, 200 people, it could be very quickly to clear the, all the small rubble off the land in the surrounding 100 yards or so and build, quickly build a mound um, of stone. So if you've got that mound, again, in the, um, if they've filled up basically dry stone walled, but very quickly, they filled up the interior of, of, the, uh, of what we consider to be the chamber inside. They filled that chamber with stone. They've encased the entire thing in a mound of stone. They then drag the stone, uh, the capstone, up that stone. It will take the strain, and that stone inside and out of the chamber will hold these legs um, so that they can't move. They drag it on, and then they pull all of that stone away. That's that's my um, impression. So, um, and that solves the problem of having of basically, particularly, even just having 100, 200 people walking around in um, what is sort of continually dampish uh, whales, even that, you're just going to end up with a quagmire of mud very quickly, just like Glastonbury Festival or something. So yeah, this actually using stone cures that problem. This is a closing thought. I think it very likely that um, they used, um, that the, these were seasonal. They must have been to, a, well, they're obviously going to be seasonal to, to a degree, but um, I wonder as well about that when they're shifting these boulders, whether they did it when, when the ground was frozen. Um, it's another option rather than it being dry, that they did it when there was a hard frost and that helps, the, helps them to slide the boulders along the surface. Um, yeah. There's a big question I've stumbled across here with just near here. I'm uh, just to close. I'm very close to the quarry where the blue stones at um, the, in the center of Stonehenge were taken from. There's a face in the quarry that exactly matches one of the blue stones in, blue, in Stonehenge. It's thought that, that, that those stones in the center of Stonehenge um, were constructed in a stone circle over here before they were taken over to Stonehenge. And there's a question which I've been to that quarry. Uh, I'll put a little picture on over here. It's a long way, obviously, from here in, uh, on the southwesterly uh, tip of Wales, Pembrokeshire. It's a long way from here all the way down to Salisbury Plain. Uh, I don't know how far it will be. And to me, it begs the question, did they transport those blue stones on, did they do it by sea? It's the most obvious uh, uh, solution to that problem, because we're quite close to the sea here. Um, the Avon-Bristol Channel 
grows it all, all from the south. You can cut in so to really reduce the amount, the distance you're going to have to take those stones across the land. So there's an interesting uh, little exploration for somebody up there. Um, there is a stream running right past the bottom of that quarry, which uh, I haven't actually tracked it, but yeah, it, it, it goes out to the sea. Was that a larger, uh, a larger, was that a larger river in, that, in those days? Could they have taken those, those stones down that river? That's the question. But yeah, there we go. It's my personal my, uh, solution to how they got these capstones on. Mounds of stone walled in. And as well, that's the same kind of craft. It's the same, um, yeah. It's, it's all that kind of dry stone walling. Uh, mindset um, so it's something which would be kind of immediately apparent I think to them hi there you go dawn at Pentra Ethan in Pembrokeshire, in the land of the dragon. Hi. I hope that um, interested a few of you. A few things to think about. Little controversy. <laughs> and all that business. Nah, it's a lot of bollocks. It's free for all. It's all there to be considered and thought about. Um, on my way out, there are a lot of very large uh, flat boulders around here and I can't help but wonder the uh, Kilcluny dolmen that other dolmen that I can't remember the name of in Ireland um, I struggled at the time Bally de Hob no not Bally de Hob another Bally um, which is in that truly ancient hand trim the two dolmens I visited in uh, touring ancient Antrim video, Tricklo, Ticklo Dolman, and the other one, both of those, there were two Dolmans next to each other. The same Kilcluny Dolman, there was the main Kilcluny Dolman, the next to it, a little Dolman. To me, it had a real feeling of his and hers Dolmans. And um, I wonder, I, I really wonder, I, I think, I strongly suspect that once upon a time there were two dolmens here too. And that uh, one of those big flat boulders laying in the field is the capstone for one of those. And I, yeah, I can't help but wonder if we looked under the, if we could dug underneath, if we'd find, lo and behold, several stones, big flat stones, skewed over in that same manner as that one I visited. Um, on the moor. I'm just charging my batteries up. Aye. So, I shall leave it at that. One point. Yeah, I'm slightly, must admit, I've sli been slightly, a uh, little bit despondent about YouTube just with its uh, unresponsiveness of the algorithm. It gets a bit irritating at times. But, uh, so I'm careful how much I invest myself in it these days. But uh, yeah, that film is pretty much finished, but I'm kind of building onto it. Um, so we shall see. It will appear at some point or another. Aye, there we go. Stay dangerous, folks. Take it easy, whatever you're doing. I hope you're enjoying it. Cheerio. Bye. Through one of the marvels of modern science, I speak now to link in closer you. Our path to the present and dark future to all to each to make that union we speak.